want to ask if you have a copy of God's Word with you, a a Bible, to find your place in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'm currently uh, preaching through this chapter of the Bible, a series of messages entitled, I Am Not All Right. We all at times face what the poem writer once called the dark night of the soul. And we are not alone. We know that our Lord, Isaiah 53, was a man uh, well associated with grief and suffering. And then we see in Scripture stories from the lives of the saints uh, that teach us people of God are not immune to hard times in life. The saints many times suffer emotional, physical, spiritual, relational distress. The old axiom really is true. It's not a matter of if you go through hard times in life, it's a matter of when. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see a story from the life of Elijah, a story that details the way in which he had a complete emotional, spiritual, and physical breakdown. And we're looking at this story to draw encouragement and instruction for ourselves. You know, we we talked last week about how Satan loves to deal in secrecy. He likes to make you think that you're alone. Not only does he like to deal in secrecy, he likes to deal in isolation. He likes to cut you off from the real realities of life. He wants you to be blinded to the fact that suffering many times and mental and emotional strain are a part of our human condition. He doesn't want you to know that other people struggle. He wants you to think you are weird, you are unique, you are the problem. And with that, he wants to to heap all types of guilt and shame upon your life and really do a number on you. So so it's real refreshing many times to just hear testimony from another believer who's been there, who struggled. How much more encouraging to open the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God and to read about one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel, if not the greatest prophet in the history of Israel, and to see that this individual came to a breaking point. What we see is breaking point reach its crescendo in verse number four. The Bible says, but he, speaking of Elijah, went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said in praying, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life for I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. So we're walking through this passage, and I'm really trying to allow the Lord to lead us. I mean, I always try to do that, hopefully, in preaching, but really trying to be sensitive as we speak on this subject. I don't know how long we'll go in this chapter. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move the ball down the field a little bit this morning, and my plan is to speak on two realities, two realities that will, I believe, help us when we're at that place where we can say, I'm not all right. But, but I want us to take note this morning, first of all, that society is indeed reeling from an epidemic of silent suffering when it comes to emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being. It seems that while humanity has progressed in things like technology and the sciences and our quality of life, we have in many ways regressed in regards to mental and emotional well-being. Recent research has remarked a dramatic increase in mental health maladies here in the United States. A recent study revealed that Americans on average would say they're having at least one day or one day more of great emotional darkness than they've had in the past. In fact, research has revealed that along with the uptick in emotional emotional maladies in our country, there's also a new phenomenon that researchers are calling deaths of despair. 
deaths of despair, deaths related to drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and suicide in the United States of America. These types of deaths have increased so much in our country that the life expectancy of the average American is going down. In fact, it's been decreasing for three consecutive years, and such a phenomenon has not been seen since the First World War. And so this is startling. And God bless the United States of America and all that we have, our prosperity, yet we seem uninformed and ignorant of how to deal with mental health. Now, in all of this, Harvard researchers have unearthed a, another discovery, one that has them startled. In all of their research, they've discovered that religion, religion is actually a good antidote against the prevailing mental health crisis. They've noted that women who profess religious devotion, and we're not just talking about evangelical conservative Christianity here, talking about any religion at all, but women who profess religious involvement are 68% less likely to die by suicide, drug, overdoses, or alcohol. And men are, men who profess to be religious are 33% less likely. So, so here, uh, researchers in our nation, people with PhDs publishing scholarly journal, journal articles, researchers are revealing that indeed there's this mental health crisis, but then to their own shock, they're revealing religion just may have a positive role in this situation. So I believe we can look at, we can look at general revelation, what humanity discovers by its own investigation and say, there is a problem and perhaps we have an answer. Furthermore, we can look at special revelation, the word of God and say, yes, there is a problem. We see it played out in the life of Elijah and the life of other saints. And at the same time, we know in the gospel of Jesus Christ and our crucified and risen Lord, we have an answer. So let's look at the word of God this morning and let's discuss two realities about the dark season of life. And so here's what I'm going to do through the rest of this study by God's grace and Lord willing. I want to share with you realities about the dark seasons of life. We're going to do that for two or three weeks and then we're going to shift gears and talk about we're gonna talk about remedies for the dark seasons of life. But let's talk about some realities. I believe these realities will take off some blinders. These realities will open our eyes in a way and give us some wisdom to understand how the dark seasons of life work. And I believe this morning we're looking at two realities that are kind of ground zero in the school of suffering. Two realities we really need to grasp if we want to fight for our emotional, mental, spiritual and physical well-being. Uh, number one, consider this reality from the word of God. Circumstances are not the basis for our well-being. The Christian is to live different than non-Christians. People who belong to the Lord can live different than people who belong to the world. I, I was I'm reading in my devotional time this book written by a Puritan. It's called The Rare Jewel, uh, the Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It was written by a man named Jeremiah Burroughs, who faced great suffering in his life. But this morning as I was reading, he was talking about how for, for most people, for non-Christians, the source of contentment is this and this alone. How many possessions do I have? What do I own? What do I possess? He remarked this morning that for a Christian, the question's totally different. While the rest of the world is asking, what do I possess? The Christian asks, who possesses me? For the Christian, contentment comes from a relationship with the Lord, and that contentment persists no matter what life circumstances may bring, whether good or bad. In 1969, uh, the rock group Led Zeppelin 
released their first album and they had their first song that made its foray into the Billboard Top 100. That song was entitled Good Times, Bad Times. And apart from having some strong guitar riffs, that song made a really good observation about life. Indeed, life will have good times and bad times. Y'all with me? Say amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Say, oh me. Good times and bad times. Now, here's one thing that's really interesting about Elijah's breakdown here. His breakdown occurred within a bad time, but it it occurred after a really good time. You see, 1 Kings 19, you have Elijah getting to his wit's end. But what did you have in 1 Kings 18? You had Elijah at Mount Carmel, a showdown with the prophets of Baal. You all remember the story? It's one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament. It contains this remarkable miracle in which the prophets of Baal lined up on one side and Elijah by himself lined up on another side. And they prepared sacrifices, they prepared altars, and they called their respective gods to come down and show their glory and consume the altar and the offerings. And we know the end of the story, 1 Kings 18, 39, the prophets of Baal were put to shame. They were confounded. Baal was proved to be the false god and There was no report from Baal, no answer when the prophets of Baal called out to him. But when Elijah called out with one simple, straightforward, spiritual prayer, Yahweh, the Lord, showed up and consumed the offering. Lapped up all the water and the trenches around the altar. And the folks who witnessed that scene, 1 Corinthians, 1 Kings 18, 39, had to say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. In Israel's history, this event was regarded as one of the foremost miracles of all. In fact, James and John, the disciples of Jesus, when they were following the Lord, They believed that they, like Elijah, should have been able to call down fire from the sky, Luke 9, 9, 54. When we read the book of Revelation, we learn that the Jews had an anticipation that at the end of time, there would be an Elijah-like figure who would return to the earth and call down fire from the sky. So we see that this was one of the greatest miracles in the history of Israel. Elijah was regarded as one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. This was one of the greatest events in Jewish history. And Elijah was at the center of it. He was the prophet being used by the Lord to instigate this entire event. Yet moments later, he got to his wit's end. Moments later, he had an emotional and physical breakdown And he cried out, he cried out, Lord, take my life. And a lesson from his fallout is found for us. Life circumstances, whether good or bad, should not be the foundation for our happiness and fulfillment in life. In fact, sometimes things can be good in life while we are not good. Perhaps you've experienced this before. You're in a dark season of life. You're experiencing great discouragement and despair, some depression and disillusionment. And somebody asks you, what's wrong? And you really can't give an answer. You can't put your finger on it. In fact, you feel a little bit of shame because you know I've got a lot to be thankful for. Things are pretty good. I'm a Christian and I believe this book, but something's unsettled in your soul. Hear this believer to be spiritually and emotionally strong. We've we've got to learn the secret of Christian contentment. We've got to learn how to find our strength and joy in Christ and his reality, not our circumstances, not whether things are good or bad. 
Real emotional and spiritual fortitude comes our way when we know how to live independent of our circumstances and dependent on Christ. This was the testimony of the Apostle Paul. He said in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, listen, he said, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. That word translated secret there where Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content. The Greek word is one that was used in the ancient Roman world to speak of the secret initiation rites of the Roman mystery religions. Paul used that word to describe a a secret that belongs to Christians. Something that takes place within the church and only amongst God's special people. You see Christ when the Holy Spirit is in your heart and when you're seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18, Christ will lead you to discover this secret, this Christian initiation, right, if you will, something that only believers can learn. Christ will lead you to learn the secret of Christian contentment. You see, an abiding relationship with Christ, not the successes or failures of life, is the, barom- is the thermometer that sets the temperature of Christian contentment. If we want to navigate the dark seasons of life well and even the good seasons of life well, we, we've got to learn this biblical lesson from Christ. Circumstances are not the basis of our well-being. So whether things are good or whether things are bad, learn to look beyond your circumstances and to look to Christ. Learn to rest, not in whether things are good or bad, but learn to rest in the gospel. Learn what Elijah had to learn through this experience. Neither the mountaintop nor the valley has to determine the tenor of your joy. In Jesus, you can have joy regardless of the circumstances of life. So we see this first reality. Circumstances are not the basis for our well-being. Number two, I want, I want us to, to speak for a while on this, re, this second reality. And I would state it like this. The fear of people is a great enemy to our well-being. The fear of people is a great enemy to our well-being. When we study Elijah's breakdown, we see that a lone individual contributed to his breakdown. A woman named Jezebel gave the spark that started a fire of discouragement and despondency in the life of this prophet. We see her mentioned in verse number two. Well, let's look at verse number one. The Bible says in 1 Kings 19, one, Ahab told Jezebel, everything that Elijah had done. So Ahab is the king at this point. Jezebel is his wife. He reports to Jezebel, the king does everything that Elijah had done. What's he talking about? Everything that happened in 1 Kings 18. The way that the prophet was used to bring the glory of the Lord down to earth. The way the prophet was used to confound the prophets of Baal. The way the prophet was used to put to death the prophets of Baal. Verse two. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she threatens to have him killed. And we see verse three, look in your Bible. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. 
Now know this believer, you can go back to the Garden of Eden in the beginning of time. There are really two sins and two emotional and spiritual maladies that really find themselves at the root of most sin. Number one, pride, and number two, fear. And we see Elijah giving in to fear here. Take note, fear in your life can be like a lead, a lead domino that when tipped, knocks down a lot of other dominoes in your life and leads to great destruction. Even a breakdown like the one Elijah experienced. But notice behind his fear, there is an individual, there is a person, Jezebel. She was known, 1 Kings 16, 31, for her fierce devotion to the false god, Baal. And it was her husband, King Ahab, 1 Kings 16, 29 through 30, who was known or regarded as one of the most infamously evil kings of all of Israel's history. And Jezebel was right there with him in the evil, the idolatry, the immorality. In fact, she was so evil, her name in Israel became synonymous with wickedness and ungodliness, ungodliness in the land. And still to this day, her name is used as a label for one who is of shady character and ill repute. Several years ago in Atlanta, a new magazine was published and the, the magazine focused on Atlantan lifestyle and focused on things in the culture of Atlanta that are given over to indulgence and decadence and the publishers of that magazine chose the name Jezebel for the title of their magazine. And so still to this day, we're familiar with the character of this individual. And we see from the Bible that she was really the driving force behind Ahab's idolatrous monarchy. 1 Kings 29, 21, 5 through 9 tells us as much. We see here in our current text after the showdown at Mount Carmel, after the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Jezebel, took the reins of her husband's leadership and concocted a scheme to do away with Elijah, that one who had had her prophets put to death. And so she said in verse two, may the gods punish me and do so severely, Elijah. If I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She didn't mince words. The message was clear. She had designs to have Elijah killed. So verse three, Elijah became afraid. So let's just park there for a moment and notice that the fear of a person was the source, the spark, and the starting point for Elijah's despair, discouragement, and despondency. Elijah fell for an age-old sin we call the fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us, the fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Now let's, let's make like a Kit Kat commercial and give Elijah a break here. You know, his fear was justified to a sense, Right? I mean, if you received a royal dispatch this morning, a presidential letter telling you that your life was at stake, see or no, would you have any fear? Of course you'd have a degree of fear. The, the real problem with Elijah here is not that he had fear, it's that he allowed his fear to run wild. He allowed his fear to set the agenda for his life. He allowed fear to control his headspace. So sometimes fear in life is normal to a degree. I can remember when one of the uh, children was young, we were at a, a mall in Lawton, Oklahoma, and we were leaving, and this child just decided to run all of a sudden and took off running through the mall and hit the exit doors, and we knew where this child was going. 
If he kept up his pace running, once he went through those exit doors, before he knew it, he was going to be right in the street. And we knew how cars came around the corner in front of that mall. And so as he hit the doors, I screamed his name and said, stop. He broke down crying. Daddy yelled at me. Daddy yelled at me in front of other people. And I talked to him about how I had, though it seemed like a mean response, a justified response. Why? There was a healthy fear of my child running into the street. So know this, fear is not an ungodly emotion in and of itself. Fear isn't necessarily wrong, but fear can become wrong. Fear can morph into sin when it becomes fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. This is where fear becomes a problem. When you begin to interpret fear in the wrong way, use fear in a wrong way, and allow fear to control you in a wrong way. See, here is something strong Christians have to learn. Here's something Elijah had to learn. Here's something I could show you in Lamentations chapter 2 that Jeremiah had to learn. Strong Christians have to learn to take their emotions and to process them according to the truth of God. I like to call it feel and deal. Feel the emotion and then deal with the emotion. Recognize, Lord, I have a degree of fear Tell the Lord all about it, Lamentations 2, 19. Pour out your heart before the Lord as if it's water. Tell him all about the emotions you're feeling. Talk about your emotions. And then reflect on his truth. Reflect on his realities. Think, what would the Lord say about my emotions? Remember what the Lord has done in the past. Give him praise for his power, his wisdom, and allow the Lord to help you process your emotions in accordance with his realities. See, think about Elijah and how absurd this looks here. Verse 3, he's running for his life. Why? He's afraid of Jezebel. Just a few verses earlier, he saw the Lord open up the windows of heaven and come down and put on a mighty display of his power and his glory. Yet here, because of the fear of man, the fear of a woman, he has a spark of fear. and He allows that fear to run wild and control him. In light of the display of the Lord's miraculous power at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, 38 through 39, it seems that Elijah could have exhibited greater faith when he received Jezebel's threats. He should have had more confidence in the Lord's power to deliver. If Yahweh could have sent fire from the sky to consume a burnt offering, surely he could have protected his prophet. Elijah needed more faith. He needed to process his emotions with the truth and realities of the Lord. He fell prey to the age-old trap we know as the fear of man. The fear of mankind is a snare. But the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Proverbs 29, 29, 25. So listen, when one becomes concerned in life about what people think over what God thinks, there's a problem. When you become more concerned about what people can do to you than what God can do for you, there's a problem. And here's what the Lord wants you to learn, and here's what he wants me to learn, and here's what he wants all of us to learn. The just, Romans 1, 17, lives by faith. Faith in the Lord's power over my life will vanquish fear over man's power over my life. You see, when one believes that others have more power over their lives than God does, psychological strain is certain. To be spiritually and emotionally healthy, we must learn to keep people in their proper perspective. Many are guilty in life and they suffer the consequences. Many are guilty in life as the same faux pas of Elijah. 
They mentally maximize the power people have over them while mentally minimizing the power God has over them. And this is folly. And this will lead to an emotional, spiritual fallout. Several years ago, Laura and I together read a book entitled 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. It wasn't written from a Christian perspective, but there's a lot of good things in this book. And one of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do, according to the author, is they don't give their power away. They don't give their power away to people. That is, mentally strong people don't allow other people to be the controlling, dominating force in their lives. They don't hand off their emotional well-being and their emotional thought process, processes to the schemes, threats, and opinions of others. The author says, giving other people the power to control how you think, feel, and behave makes it impossible to be mentally strong. Retaining your power is about being confident in who you are and the choices you make despite the people around you and the circumstances you're in. Now, I like that book because it gives good diagnosis to a problem. But remember, as a Christian, when we read books like that, we can let worldly people many times diagnose problems, but we need the Lord to give the right prognosis, the right course of treatment. For that reason, I've read another book by Edward Welch called When People Are Big and God is Small. Such an important book if you're struggling with the fear of mankind. In this book, the the author examines that famous sin, the fear of man, and he unearths the way in which this isn't a sin spoken of much, but this sin is really at the root of many of our struggles. And when many of us are facing emotional and spiritual strain, if we were to really dig beneath the surface, we would find that the sin of the fear of man is lurking. And the remedy in our lives is to have a bigger view of God and a smaller view of man. I'm telling you, there's a problem in 21st century American Christianity. We've got a lot of man-centered teaching and preaching. We got a lot of man-centered Bible studies and books. We've got a lot of man-centered churches and denominations. We need more God-centered, Christ-centered, cross-centered, Bible-centered, Holy Spirit-centered churches. Only the cross and the gospel and the spirit of God within us can give us release and victory and help with all of our struggles. Welch says, if the gaze of man awakens fear in us, how much more so the gaze of God? The praise of others, that wisp of a breeze that lasts for only a moment, can seem more glorious to us than the praise of God. So may we be on guard against this sin. Another book that may help is a book entitled Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And in this book, the author talks about Satan's threefold strategy he's used since the Garden of Eden to ensnare people. That same strategy is seen when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4. The same strategy is seen playing out in the kings of Israel and the life of Solomon. The strategy is clearly outlined in 1 John 2, 16, where John, writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father. Those three areas contain overarching categories for every sin humanity struggles with. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lust of the flesh... That deals with the pursuit of godless pleasure. The lust of the eyes, that deals with the pursuit of possessions. And the pride of life deals with pride and ego. In that book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, the author defines that last sin or category, the pride of life, with these terms. I live for what people think about me. 
That's a good way of putting it. That really cuts to the quick. That's what pride is all about. And do you see how the fear of man, this concern of what others think about you, really at its heart is an issue of pride, an obsession for what people think about yourself and what God thinks about you. And now, so what do we do when we face pressure from people? First of all, we remember Jesus. He's an example for us in all of this. Elijah faced cruel mistreatment from others. You may face hostility and affliction from others. You may have disagreements and divisions with people, and those things wreck you emotionally and mentally. What can you do? First of all, look to Jesus. Hebrews 12, 3 tells us, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't be weary and give up. Friends, every time you're wrecked by what others say about you or do to you, look at, to Jesus on the cross and visualize those people walking by and wagging their heads and mocking him. You have an advocate in the Lord Not only is he your example, he is your helper. In the moment of strain, in the moment of hurt because of what people have said and done, you can look to the Lord because that same one who endured great hostility from sinners, guess what? According to the Bible, there's two places he dwells. He dwells at the right hand of God and he also dwells in your heart if you've truly been born again. And Hebrews 13, 6 says that you can now say, if you are a born-again believer, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What time I'm tempted to be afraid, I try to direct my mind, heart, and soul to these realities. The Lord is my helper. He holds my life in his hand. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? Some of y'all are like my car. You got a lot of mileage on you. And with that mileage, you've learned. The Lord holds you in his hand. You've been through the storm, haven't you? You've been through the fire. And now when the fire comes, don't you feel a little bit stronger because you've learned through adversity over the years? If he brings you to it, he'll bring you through it, right? And maybe that's what Elijah needed to learn here, and maybe this is what we need to learn. Turn your eyes unto Jesus. The things of this world will grow strangely dim. And then consider this. When you're suffering from people problems, when you're feeling the pull and the promptings and the pressure of the fall of the fear of man, remember that all of the saints of old face people problems. You shouldn't think that you'll be immune to suffering. Consider the crisis between Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, Moses and the murmuring multitude, David and Saul and many more. We see from Scripture, surely a part of the suffering that we will face in this world involves people problem. And Paul himself had to say in 2 Timothy 4, 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. So we shouldn't expect to come out unscathed in life from the fear of man and the threat of harm from injurious people. Instead, we've got to realize this is part of life on Planet Earth, we're subject to the consequences of the fall. And there'll be no perfection until the resurrection. There'll be no, more, no perfect peace and harmony until, harmony until paradise, the new heaven and the new earth. And so in the meantime, we've got to manage our expectations regarding others and people. In addition, we've got to be prepared to regulate our responses and our emotion with the truth of the Lord. We should be careful to cultivate the mindset of Jesus by faith. 
The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 23, when he, Jesus our Lord, was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten people. But listen, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Do you see from our Lord, do you see from the gospel of Jesus Christ, a bigger faith in the Lord will help us overcome the fear of people that sometimes drives us to the brink of a breakdown. 